So I manage Australia's water efficiency labelling and standards program, which we also just call WELLS. Um, so to just give you a little bit of a background of how, how the regulation of uh, plumbing products is structured in Australia, um, WELLS is aimed at water efficiency. It regulates a small handful of plumbing products, and it's part of the water resources section of the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. Um, now, building and plumbing regulation sits with the Australian Building Codes Board in the Department of Industry. So we have a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Uh, we do work together quite a bit, though, on those things and um, trying to work together a bit more. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is give you a bit of an overview of, of wells, um, and then I'll talk about some of the other regulation of plumbing products in Australia through Watermark and the Plumbing Code of Australia and then go into a little bit more detail about how Wells and Watermark work together. And then uh, after I'm finished, Brett Lovett from Standards Australia will talk a little bit more about the standards processes and how those fit into our, our systems. So Wells is a uh, consumer labeling scheme. So it's really about informing consumers about how much water a product is going to use once it's installed and, and uh, being operated. So it covers, um, in terms of plumbing products, it just covers showers, taps, toilets, urinals, and flow controllers. So it's a small proportion, but those are the ones that use most of the water. And it also covers uh, clothes washing machines and dishwashers. And all those products have to be tested for water efficiency in addition to uh, performance requirements. And they have to be registered with wells and then labeled in accordance with our um, Australian standard for that. <coughs> now, wells started during what we refer to as the Millennium Drought. So it was a drought that ran for over 12 years. Um, covered <laughs> most of the parts of Australia and certainly the parts where all of our capital cities are and where most people live. So it was a period that really uh, sort of galvanized public views about water saving and, and so water saving in Australia is really seen as, um, it's almost like a moral issue. It's a really, you know, important to Australians to the point where people would joke that young Australians love to travel, they love to take a gap year, they love to go overseas. And, and it was, you could tell the Australian in the European city because they were at the public fountain that runs all the time and they were trying to figure out how to turn it off because someone had left the fountain running. So, <laughs> so, so people are really concerned about saving water. And that's part of why putting a label that says, that gives a star rating for how much water a product's gonna con consume is important in Australia because people will use that. So the objectives of wells, the key objective is to conserve water. So it's conserve water supplies by, by reducing water consumption. Um, the other objectives are about providing information for purchasers of water using or water saving products and promoting the adoption of new technologies or more efficient technologies. Um, it's interesting because the second two um, are really, actually it's the middle one that drives the others. So, so providing information for purchasers means innovation is supported because if you come up with a better product, it gets a higher star rating and it looks more attractive cons to consumers. So people who are at that cutting edge of, of uh, more water saving innovations tend to really support wells and uh, really happy because it, it highlights their product's advantages. Um, so if we look at then the effectiveness and how much it saves, and I've modified this table this time for the metrically challenged so I've got the, uh, <laughs> the, the water savings on the top in, in uh, gigaliters per year. And this was some estimates that were produced for us by the Institute for Sustainable Futures in Sydney. Um, and looked at, at uh, you know, the uptake of the products, how much water you could save for each one, and came up with about 70 billion liters per year in 2013, rising to over 200 billion liters in, in 2030. Um, that's with a population of about 25 million. And the interesting thing is most of the savings there come from uh, showers and clothes washing machines. Now toilets are a big water saver, but they weren't, the savings were, most of the savings from changing to more efficient toilets wasn't captured in this because uh, the plumbing codes already required the shift. So the shift was happening regardless of wells. So there were still some advantages from wells in, in encouraging people to go to say four star instead of three star, but, but uh, there's probably greater savings if you were to include that. Interestingly, there's quite a bit of um, savings in greenhouse gas emissions because there's less energy used to um, heat water in the main, and then the utility bill savings for consumers. So a lot of people who, who choose more efficient products save quite a bit of money themselves. And just to back that up, uh, we've had a look at 
you know, it's easy to do some modeling and say, yeah, it's saving water, but are we seeing that really coming through? Um, this is just a graph that shows um, average annual water supplied per to properties, so it's domestic properties. And Wells commenced in 2005. Uh, I don't have data from before that, so you can't really see if it was already dropping or if it was a, a level system. But you can see where there were some big, big drops, and the biggest drop around 2010, and then a little bit of a bounce back. That's when the millennium drought ended. But what's interesting is that when the drought ended, it didn't go up to the pre-drought levels. And that's what you'd expect if people have installed more efficient products. So behaviors tend to spring back, um, but the, the shift to more efficient products still is evident. So Wells isn't the only uh, program that regulates plumbing products, obviously, because it's only about water efficiency. So our other um, programs, we've got Watermark, which is a mandatory certification scheme for plumbing products. And that's the part that certifies that products are fit for purpose and authorized for use. And we've also got the Plumbing Code of Australia, and that's now part of the National Construction Code. And that's got the technical provisions for the design and installation of plumbing and drainage systems. And that links back because to Watermark because it requires certain products to be Watermark certified. Um, that's a national code, but then it's up to um, states and territories to, to call it up. So we'll look at each of those just a little bit. So with Watermark, um, basically all products that are proposed for use in a plumbing or drainage installation require a risk assessment. Now, Watermark has already looked at some of those products, so a product that's already on the Watermark schedule has already had that assessment done, and it's been assessed as requiring a Watermark certification. And then there's a schedule of excluded products, and those have been assessed as not requiring Watermark certification. So if you come in with a product, if it's on either of those schedules, that tells you whether it requires certification or not. Uh, products that are not on either schedule require a risk assessment before they can be used. So if we look at the different agencies' um, responsibilities under Watermark, the Australian Building Codes Board owns and administers the Watermark scheme. Uh, we've got a joint accreditation system of Australia and New Zealand, and that accredits approved certifiers for Watermark. And then the approved cert certifiers are uh, Watermark conformity assessment bodies, and those certify products under Watermark, and that includes evaluating the products and doing ongoing surveillance. So at the moment, there are eight Watermark uh, cabs um, in Australia. And then the approved user has a responsibility to ensure that the products continue to comply with the watermark requirements. And then the Plumbing Code of Australia, as I said, is now a national code, but it's called up by state and territory legislation, so there are some differences in how they apply the code. But I think it was a, a tremendous effort to get a uniform code and a, and a really big step. So essentially, um, each state and territory has acts and regulations that point to the code, and then those reference other documents such as the Australian standards. So I'll pop back to Wells now and talk a little bit about how we run our scheme and how we manage compliance and enforcement, and then how that links with, with Watermark. Um, so all the products in our scheme are required to be registered before they can be legally sold in Australia. And the registration applications have to include the test reports from a, an accredited laboratory, and that shows the water consumption in accordance with our product specific and our well standards. And they also have to provide the watermark cert certificate. So they've got to prove that it's got a watermark certificate because we want to make sure that our program works in concert with watermark and we're not cer certifying something under one government program that isn't fit for purpose or, or doesn't align with the other government needs. Um, we require people to supply product images. That helps with verification. It helps our compliance officers and it helps consumers because they can all go into our registration database, which is publicly available, and they can look at a product, and they can look at the image and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not right, or yep, that's, that's what it says it is, that looks good. Um, the other thing people have to pay, do to register their product is pay registration fees, and that covers 80% of our costs. So 80% funded by industry, 10% by the uh, federal government, and 10% by states and territories. And it's actually, we find it really important to have those that split because having the states and territories make a contribution means they've got buy-in and they work effectively with us and they're interested in working with us. Now, while I'm on this slide, I'll pop up. I mentioned at the top, top point um, that the products need to be tested in accordance with uh, our standards. And there is a specific Wells standard, 6400, 
It's available from SAI Global if anybody wants to have a look. We pay to make it free for people to download. Um, and one of the things that we've been looking at, so that standard sets out some of the specific tests required for water consumption. It sets out what you need to get a particular star rating for a product, and it just sets out the labeling requirements. And as Dave mentioned, uh, we're now looking at developing an international standard with ISO. So we've now got uh, the go ahead, and we've got a project committee set up, and the first meeting is in July. So look at whether we can um, come up with a common approach to how we assess products for water efficiency. So that's an interesting project and one that we're really excited about because we think the consistency will be helpful, but also having that sort of underpinning standard will make it easier for other countries that want to implement that sort of program to pick up an existing standard and uh, move forward with that. Now, you can have the best program in the world, the best standards, the best way of testing for con conformity, but if you don't enforce it, um, there's always, you know, you get maybe 90, 95, 98 percent of people, um, you know, comply willingly, but you've got a small percentage of people that will try and work around it. Maybe unless you're from Switzerland, maybe then you get 100 percent of people complying. <laughs> but in Australia, you've always got a small percentage that will try and uh, find a way around the, the, uh, the rules. So with wells, um, some of our key areas of risk are, and we've, we've looked at this, we've talked to industry, we've had them, we did some consultation to make sure it's not just a government view of where the risks are, but we're actually talking to industry about where they think the risks are. And really, um, the big areas of risk that they've identified are changes to the traditional supply chains. And that's mainly about, in the past, there were a small number of importers bringing products into Australia and selling them to retailers and to builders. And now it's very easy for, for builders or you know, smaller agencies to go directly overseas and say, I want something that looks like this. And they can do that in a way that's perfectly legitimate, but they can also go through, take a, take a legitimate prod product and get everything counterfeited. So the watermark stamp can be faked, the wells labels can be faked, or they don't bother with those at all. So dealing with those changes, that's a really important one for us. And, um, and the other area is in the building industry. So the building industry is still, still has requirements under our wells legislation but it's sometimes not been aware that they need to still be supplying products that are wells registered and that when they're offering buildings to purchasers and it's a new building, they've got to give that wells information about the water efficiency. So in the building industry, we've been working with them to just inform them and as I said, most people come on board once they know it's a legal requirement and a lot of them come on board quite happily because they want to promote the water efficiency, the sort of, you know, green credentials of, of their projects. Um, with the traditional su supply chains and the changes to people getting things directly from overseas, we do have enforcement officers that are s really experienced investigators that have been looking, looking into that and uh, identifying some situations where that's happened. And one of the really nice things about the legislation that we operate under is it's got some pretty big sticks. So when we do find people who are not complying, often it's a, a mistake. They didn't know, so we work with them cooperatively. But where people are, you know, willfully you know, counterfeiting products and, and uh, trying to subvert the system or where they don't respond to our, our cooperative approaches, uh, we can give them infringement notices, which are over $6,000 in Australian per offense. Now, when you take that to scale, if someone's got a building with, you know, say, 500 u uh, units in it and each unit has a certain number of taps and showers and toilets, you know, it really amplifies and it can become quite, quite big. Um, and if we don't go through the infringement notices, we can take them to court and then the penalties become 10 times that. So even a retailer who's selling 100 products that are all non-compliant, um, that could be, well, over 600,000 in infringement notices, over 6 million if a court imposed the full penalty. So we do have some teeth, uh, which is nice. Now, one of the interesting things that we've come across is that uh, compliance and enforcement for wells is quite different to how compliance and enforcement works for watermark. So for watermark, um, the requirements apply at the point of installation. So people can sell products that don't have watermark, but they can't, a plumber can't install them. The licensed plumber is responsible for ensuring that the products are watermark certified. And, um, and then the state and territory government regulators are responsible for enforcing that requirement. So they do the inspections, they check. Um, 
And then also an approved certifier grants the use of the watermark trademark to the user through, through a license agreement. Now, Wells is quite different because Wells uh, registration and labeling is required at the point of sale, and that's for anybody who's supplying Wells products. So it can be for, for a manufacturer, an importer, a retailer, or a builder who's supplying those products as part of a new building. So we've got quite a different scope. Water management and, and building management is the responsibility of state and territories, not the federal government. But in the case of Wells, all those states and territories have agreed to hand over the um, administration of the program to the federal government. So we manage the, uh, the registration, we manage the compliance and enforcement on their behalf. And so it's the federal Wells regulator who's responsible for enforcement. So it's more of a national scale approach. And then we do have that link where watermark certification is required before products can be, can be Wells registered. Um, so it's an interesting issue in Australia at the moment because some stakeholders are asking for watermark to apply at the point of sale as well as Wells because it does stop at that point of, of you know, consumers buying. But there's also quite a lot of value in having plumbers have a responsibility and certainly in having the states uh, do that checking at the certification level. Um, they've said, you know, tell what works, what doesn't work. I think the, the regulation at the point of installation works well where the states um, have the funds and do a lot of the, that enforcement. It's quite variable in different states. So in the Australian Capital Territory, where I live, 100% of installations get inspected. Um, in other states, it's an audit system. So there's a little bit of variation in, in how that operates. Um, but we do try and work together, and we've been talking quite a lot with the building regulators in the states and territories, so that when they find products that aren't compliant, we can work together so they can take action against the licensed plumber, but we can also take action against the builder. So I'll open that up for, for questions. And Thank you, Dr. Grossman. Um, I have a question for you. Um, you know, in the United States, um, product <laughs> certification agencies have their own mark. And uh, they apply those marks on products to, to show that they comply with the schemes that they're certifying to, with one exception. Uh, if we're certifying to the to WaterSense program, that it's the WaterSense label that's applied to the product. So we have two different ways of labeling products in the United States. And, and um, you mentioned the watermark and the, the Wells label. Who, who owns those labels and how are they applied? And do the certifiers have their own unique mark and can they be applied? So watermark is owned by the Australian Building Codes Board. And uh, the products need to be stamped. Now, Shane can correct me if I'm wrong because I am a little bit out of my, my area of greatest expertise here. So. Uh, but the products need to be stamped, so they've got a, it's embossed at the factory with, with their watermark uh, label. The um, conformity assessment body that's assessed that is not on there, but it's searchable through the database. So if you look at the watermark on a product and you go into the watermark database, uh, you should be able to identify who's responsible for, um, for certifying it. And certainly in Wells, we do that when people submit an application for registration. If there's anything at all suspicious about that, or what we'd call dodgy, um, then you can go into there, we, our staff go in and have a look and they check who certified it and if they've got questions they'll go to that conformity assessment body and, and say did you certify this and they'll say yes or they'll say no <laughs> and then, then we can sort it out. Um, so with Wells we don't, we don't have, so uh, Wells, I'm trying to think of who owns our label, I think um, the trademark might actually sit with Standards Australia. Yeah, Brett's nodding. Yeah, so the trademark for the, the label sits there. Uh, we've got the rights to use the label, and anybody who's got you know the appropriate, um, uh, who's, who's registered their product can use the label. Um, but we don't, again, we don't put the, the body on it, so the labels differ a little bit for plumbing products. The company that's done the registration's name goes onto the, the label. And that was something that was changed uh, a couple years ago at the behest of industry, because um, if the label says this is a, you know, registered by Coroma and it's on a product that's not Coroma, anybody can tell that that's a fake certificate. So it's really about trying to cut down on that, that falsification. So has that answered your question? It does. Um, I already knew the answer, but I wanted to, to get that out there. <laughs> oh, you there. were testing me. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it's important that we compare and contrast some uniqueness of these program schemes. And, uh, and this, this question led to uh, an answer of, 
Australia has a centralized database of all the compliant products, where in the United States, for example, or in North America and Canada, you have to go to each certifier to, uh, to search their database for, for compliant products. So that's, uh, you know, comparing and contrasting and building our toolbox, that's one of the items I wanted to, to point out in the discussion today. So that was a good answer, and I appreciate it. Uh, any other questions? Okay, Tom. Uh, Dr. Grossman, I don't know if you can answer this, but you touched a little bit on some future possible problems arising, and one of them was the modular industry. Um, has the modular industry, uh, is it landed on the shores of Australia where there's uh, pods coming in that are already, say, a bathroom pod, or are the products still uh, required to be exposed so you can inspect to see if they have the stamps on them or, or the walls completely covered and, and we don't know if they're meeting compliance or not. I think you've just described the problem in a nutshell. So yes, we do have, have pods coming over um, and that is one of the issues with them is, is it can be sometimes hard to see what's sitting behind those products. So my program only regulates, you know, it's the showers, the taps, the toilets, which you generally can see, but the other products, um, yeah, they can be hidden, so it's an issue. I saw other hands, so Pete, was there anybody else? Maggie? For the third party certifiers that are in their database, is there an accreditation process for those through your organization or some other organization to be able to do that? Yeah, so those, those uh, certifying bodies are accredited by uh, JASANTS, which stands for the Joint Accreditation Service of Australia and New Zealand. Hey, Carl. Uh, I don't know the answer to this. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in the States, uh, there's uh, uh, um, various incentives that uh, various levels of government uh, would uh, offer to consumers uh, to provide a refund to purchase labeled products. Uh, we're talking about right now um, advocating to the federal government and to state governments to provide for tax holidays on purchased products that are, are labeled with the water sense mark. Uh, are there similar incentive programs in Australia? Yeah, there, there are, and they tend to be run by state governments or local governments or sometimes a particular water utility will run a program. And so there'll be things like... Um, offering you know, a $100 or $200 rebate if you replace your old washing machine with a five-star one, or programs where the utility will send someone in to replace your showers with more efficient ones, or that sort of thing. There's also an example we found out about just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sydney Water that supplies water for the city of Sydney. Um, they did a project where they identified particular uh, large buildings that were using more water than you'd expect for a building of that, that size and came to an arrangement where they went in, so, so Sydney Water went in and replaced fittings with more efficient ones, with you know, higher wells ratings, and uh, uh, basically had an arrangement where the um, building owner continued paying the same water rates until they'd paid the cost of that replacement. So it was about a two-year uh, return period. So for two years, they paid the same, same sort of water fees that they had been paying, and then after that, they got a benefit, and Sydney Water got the benefit immediately in terms of reduced water demand. So yeah, people do use it. The other question is, um, part of the specifications for um, the specifically toilets, but also to some degree shower heads, um, have um, requirements that the uh, product be not adjustable in terms of uh, uh, consumption. Um, part of the specification for water sense uh, requires that even if you change the trim, that uh, it allows it to go up a little bit because it's almost impossible for the manufacturer to, you know, have the trim replaced and keep it at the original consumption value. But it allows for uh, about a 20% on top of that level maximum uh, adjustment no matter what you do. And it especially is important in toilets because a lot of toilets, if you take out the existing trim and put alternate trim in there, you can take a... a, a um, a uh, product that flushes at six liters and it can flush up to as high as 13. Um, so this is uh, a big problem that we find in the field all the time. And a lot of products that we see, especially from ones that are not water sense or from early in the, in the 2000s or late in the 1990s, they're, they're supposed to be flushing at six liters and we're finding they're flushing at 10, 11, 12 liters of water now 
so they're no longer flushing at the intended flush volume. Are there anti-adjustment requirements uh, as part of the well specification? So I think with toilets, I'm probably out of my, my depth, so to speak, but um, certainly with, with showers and taps, they're required to have a, the flow controller is required to be mechanically fixed. So it's not meant to be something that a consumer can just go and, and pull out. So that's one way that we, we stop things from changing. But honestly, with toilets, I, I don't know anything about how they change over time or whether there's an issue with that. Shane, do you have any knowledge of that? Other than it, it is something that occurs, but I'm not aware of any, um, to get back to the question, any preventative sanction that's embedded in the, the regime to uh, you know, sort of penalise someone who does something X the um, uh, um, uh, mark being applied. Um, I think the way the scheme works is, it, you know, it's to try and safeguard at installation as much at, at purchase and installation as much as possible. Then, what happens down the track? There's not a a penalty or disincentive to to adjust or or manipulate the performance. It's just, you know, I think as Carol was saying. Um, you know, if you go into the extent of, you know, it's seen, it's, it, it would be seen as a kind of a, a meritorious thing in Australia to have high efficiency fittings, that, you know, with the exception of probably people getting sick and tired of fairy showers, the, the, um, the, 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 the tendency to, uh, to try and interrupt the performance would be, be low, but I'm not, that's not based on any, um, any data. Uh, can I um, exploit this and ask a question? Um, the uh, the two schemes that you compared, um, interesting with the um, well scheme, you, you've got point of sale um, legislation that um, makes it an offence to sell that's the a, a mm. product, um, but not in uh, watermark. So you, you, it, it's always sort of struck me as curious that you've got water efficiency and not denigrating that in any way. That's very important. Um, but then, like fit for purpose and um, exposure to lead and, and a whole lot of other things, um, we're going to wait until that enters the supply chain and, and get picked up way down by the plumber. Um, whereas, you know, point of sale just makes it just seems so sensible to me. Have you had any? Can you make any comment on um, the efficiency of having point of sale legislation to pick up um, non-compliant product and, you know, the perhaps the lessons that might be learned about that for um, Watermark? Yeah, look, I think um, point of sale, like at point of installation, it only works as well as you do the enforcement side of it. Um, so unless you're willing to, to go out and find people who, you know, you've got to have a team that, that is invested in doing that work. Um, so I think, you know, for us it, it works quite well because we do have the resources that we can dedicate. It's still quite a small team. But we have people who can go through and identify those problems and then and then take action. Um, you know, I think one of the problems with point of installation is that it's very effective, but you have to keep doing it. And it's the same with point of sale, but I think maybe that's one of the, the areas where uh, it's a little bit different because, to be honest, like the point of sale is really effective, but having national regulation is also a really helpful thing. Uh, particularly where so much of the supply is online, so it's crossing state boundaries. So I think, I think there's a few things in there. One is if you do go to point of sale, it's really important to have it be national because sale so often happens across, oh, across jurisdictions. Um, and I think if you do it effectively, it is, it is a strong point. I, I think, to be honest, I think the ideal, ideal system wouldn't be either or. It would be to have point of sale to stop people from purchasing products that aren't safe, that aren't going to do what they're supposed to do, uh, and stop people from selling those products, of course, but also still have that requirement of point of, at point of installation because it's a really good pickup point. And besides that, the best product isn't going to do what it's supposed to if it's not installed correctly. So in my view, um, getting the best of both worlds would be ideal. Yeah. Shane, what is a fairy shower? Okay, I'm glad I'm glad we went that way. I was going a different direction. So well done. <laughs> uh, um, Bill, Bill Erickson's not here today, but he was here with us earlier this week, and 
And to your point about um, national regulations, uh, because commerce occurs across uh, state boundaries, when we first had, uh, you know, the um, um, toilet provisions come into the United States, um, uh, Bill Erickson personally was sending his trucks up to Canada to buy um, higher consumption toilets because the uh, first generation toilets, uh, many of the contractors didn't believe they worked properly. And some, and that was true in many cases, but anyway, to your point. Uh, is there any other questions for Dr. Grossman? Thanks.